Hi, I'm Carl Franklin. In this episode of Blazor Train, I'll show you how to do basic authentication and authorization in a Blazor server app using ASP.NET Core Identity, which comes in the box car. The, uh, the box. It comes in the box. You can start out using a local DB SQL database, and then you can move it somewhere else at a later time. Just change your connection string and you'll be zooming down the tracks to success. So I purposely made this episode drop dead easy to follow. I don't go into the dirty details of how all this stuff works. You can read the documentation on your own time to figure that out. Now, I'm going to show you how to get off up and running quickly and easily. And that's coming up right now, right here on Blazor Train. See what I did there? Blazor Train! All right, so let's explore what's in the box for authentication and authorization with a Blazor project. Now, I'm going to create a Blazor server project called Basic Auth, right? And you can see that here. All right. But you can use most of what I'm going to show you with the Blazor WebAssembly uh, project, but there is a caveat, and I'll discuss that when we get there, okay? For now, we're going to create a Blazor server application. So I'll go ahead and create this. And you can see I'm using .NET 5. Now this right here, we're going to change the authentication. And we're going to select the second item here, which is individual user accounts. Also the default option to store user accounts in app. Now that doesn't mean it's going to write a JSON file and you know, put that data in the application itself. What it means is that we're going to access a local database that this application will create. And that's a, a SQL database and it's got a connection string. And if at a later time you want to migrate that database to, you know, Azure SQL or some other place, uh, you can certainly do that and just change the connection string. That's all there is to it. So this is the option that we're going to choose. I'll go ahead and create the project. Now I've got the SQL Server Object Explorer up here. And if you don't have that, you can go to the View menu and select SQL Server Object Explorer. Uh, there's a keyboard shortcut to that as well. And so uh, local DB is installed, which means that I have this basic database, uh, SQL database installed called local DB. There are no databases defined yet. But what's really cool about this is that when you choose the uh, authentication authorization option that I chose, you get a different template. And if you look in App Settings JSON, we've already got uh, a database connection string here that is local DB. And here's the database name. Now it created ASP.NET dash basic auth and then a GUID so that it's unique. Now, if you want to, you can change this. We haven't even created the database yet, but you can change this so the name of the database will be different. So I'll do that. I'll just call it basic auth. You don't need to do this, however, but it just makes it easy to identify, you know, when you put your own name to something. Okay. Now, everything is set up here so that all we have to do is one little command and it will generate the database. Over here, you got some stuff that you haven't seen before. If you look under areas, there's an identity. And under that, there's a, an identity provider. And under data, there's migrations and an application DB context, as well as your general weather forecast stuff that comes with everything. So the migrations have already been made. Um, it's a whole nother topic, database migrations. But this is how we do it with Entity Framework. Uh, you create these migrations and then you simply apply them. So to create this database, I'm going to pull up my package manager console and I'm simply going to say update database. And it's going to take the migrations that are already defined in the project which creates the database, essentially. It creates a script that creates the database. And we're going to apply that. 
And when you're done, if you refresh the databases, look, here's our basic auth right there. And we've got tables and everything. It's like a real database. <laughs> here's ASP.NET users. When we register, that's where the records go. And then we have roles, which we can define. And then we have user roles, where we apply a role to a user. So there's all sorts of stuff in here with claims and logins. But suffice to say, I'm going to start you out gently. We're going to go into this the easy way. Now, it, just because it's easy doesn't mean it's not powerful. But hopefully, anybody can do this. And hopefully, by the end of it, you'll be able to uh, create Blazor applications with basic authentication and authorization using a SQL database, and everything will be cool. All right? So now that we've done that, there's a few things we need to do to our application to support roles. Yes, we are going to use roles. Uh, so in order to do that, let's go to Startup, Add to this line right here, Services, Add Default Identity, Identity User with Options. And before we call Add Entity Framework Stores, we're going to add Add Roles. And so this is what you need in order to do role-based authorization. Now, one thing else that I need to do is add to this project a text file because I've got some notes for you and I'm going to share this code. So the uh, authentication is pretty simple. Uh, it's the authorization that's really flexible, but also some tools for managing the roles and stuff. Those are missing from uh, UI-wise from, from Blazor. So what I like to use is this project called Identity Manager. And if you go out to this GitHub link, it shows you this project. Now, this project is deprecated, yes. And there's new stuff that we'll be talking about a little bit later. However, it's still relevant. And so what I'm going to do is download this zip file, and I will install it, and then we'll pull it up in Visual Studio 2019. So here is my extracted zip file, and I'm just going to go ahead and pull up Identity Manager. Now, before we can use this, we have to make two modifications. The first modification is in startup, because by default it uses SQLite, and we want to use SQL Server, uh, and then we want to set the connection to our the same connection string that we're using here in LocalDB. So back in my notes, we're changing this add DB context from SQLite to use SQL Server. There it is. And now if you go to App Settings JSON in Identity Manager, this connection string, which is just a local DB3 database, local SQLite database, we need to change that to our connection string. So that's in App Settings JSON. Remember, this was put in here automatically, and we changed the database name to Basic Auth. All right, so I've run our app Basic Auth. And you can see now I've got this little toolbar up at the top that has register, login, and about. Now I can't log in because there's nobody registered. So the first thing we're going to do is register ourselves. Now this UI here is sort of built in, but uh, in the next Blazor train, I'm going to show you how you can customize this. But let's just register me, Carl at Franklin's Net, with capital P at SSWORD1. Don't do this at home, kids. This is just a demonstration. Uh, there's an optional step that you can do here that doesn't come in the box to confirm by email, right? Instead of doing that here because we don't have the infrastructure to do it, uh, we're going to just click to confirm the account, and it's just reminding you that you know this would be uh, the process by which you are confirmed by email. So I'm just going to go log in now. And nothing has really changed because everything is uh, doable. We haven't put any restrictions on this user. The user is by default authorized to do everything because we haven't limited what the user can do. But it does know who we are. So that takes care of the authentication part. We've been authenticated, but now we have 
to know what we can and can't do. And that's what authorization is. So here's the identity manager that's running. And if I refresh this, you can see that there's one user there. Okay, back at basic auth, let's close this and let's put in some authorization, shall we? I'm going to go to the nav menu and I'm going to restrict access to the counter link and the fetch data link with roles. And the only thing that's changed here is this authorize view. Authorize view is a component that's built into Blazor and you can say uh, what roles have access to this view. So it's a way that you can limit UI just by saying the user needs to be in this role can view counter page in order to see the link to counter and the user needs to be in this role can view weather data in order to see the link to fetch data. So I'm just going to copy this right out of here and go over to my identity manager. And I'll go to the roles page and I'll just add this role. And while I'm at it, let's add the second role, which is can view weather data. Now let's edit this user, Carl at Franklin's net, and let's add the user to can view weather data, but not can view counter page. Okay. We'll run our app again. Now I'm going to log out and log in again so that we reset those credentials. And now you can see we have access to fetch data, but we don't have access to the counter page. So while this is running, we'll just go edit the user and give them permission to view the counter page. Now, roles are a separate topic in and of themselves. These are very fine grained roles, but you know, you might have roles like administrator, manager, that kind of thing, but you can get down to this, you know, minutia if you want to use roles that way. So again, we have to log out, log back in. Now we can see the counter. All right. Now let's take counter privilege away from this user again, because there's a loophole here. All right. I don't see it here, but guess what? I can just go to the counter page by typing slash counter and there it is. Well, how can I prevent that? Turns out we can do this with an attribute. So right here, we're saying this page can't be viewed unless the user is authorized and they're in the role can view counter page. So let's try it again. Now, remember, we don't have permission to view the counter page. Let's log out, log in just to be sure. I know I don't need to because we haven't changed the security, but let me just now go directly to counter and I get not authorized. Wah, wah, wah. Okay. Let's give this user back permission to view the counter page. Log out, log in again. And now we can view the counter page. We can go there directly. It shows up in the nav bar. Everything's good. So we limited this UI here, but what about this UI here? Can we take pieces of this UI and further restrict them with roles? Let's change this button, this whole button to this. So now we've got an authorized view. Basically, there's another role that we can add called can click counter button. And if the user is in that role, they're authorized, they get the button. If they're not authorized, they get this, you do not have permission to click the counter button, please ask for permission, all right? So let's add this role, can click counter button. Let's leave our guy out of that role. We'll log in again. 
and we'll go to counter and right there it says you do not have permission to click the counter button please ask for permission well i've asked for permission and now permission is granted now I'll log out log back in and now i can do that okay now this is where we get into territory that you can't do in uh, WebAssembly, but you can do in Blazor Server, and that is use code to determine if a user is in a role. Uh, use code to determine whether or not somebody is allowed to do something. First, I'm going to go to Imports, and I'm going to add System Security Claims to my imported namespaces. All right, back to Counter. All right, here's the story. We've got this injected authentication state provider, and it's injected because we've added it, and it this is in the template. It's been added as a scoped service on the server. All right, you cannot add this to the client because uh, in WebAssembly, people can mess with the code and they can override it. So it's a it's a security risk. However, so you can't do it, but we can use this in Blazor Server. Getting back to counter, we've injected that authentication state provider into the page. Down here in uninitialized async, we're pulling out the authentication state. From that, we're getting the user, and that is a claims principle user. Now we can use that user object to inspect the user. And here where I press increment count, uh, and I've got just a message in a div, color red, um, I'm checking to see if the user is authenticated and the user is in role, can increment counter. Here's another role, let's add it. So if we pass this test and we're in the role, can increment counter, we up the counter. Otherwise, we're getting a message. You do not have permission to increment the counter. The difference here is that up to this point, all the authorization has been around UI, which is easily handled uh, by what gets sent down from a WebAssembly application, right? You either can see things or you can't see things, but the determination is made on the server. Now we're getting into the territory of code. So if I click, yeah, I do not have permission to increment the counter. Well, let's give me permission. Log out, log in. And now everything's hunky dory. So that's it for basic authentication and authorization. You can use a SQL Server. Uh, it's based on a connection string. That SQL Server can be anywhere. Uh, you get UI-based authorization in both Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly, but you can only do code-based authorization on Blazor Server. And that's it. Back to you in the studio, Carl. Yes! That was easy, wasn't it? Whoa, whoa! Next week, I'll show you how to add authentication and authorization to an existing Blazor app. We'll also talk about ways to customize the UI, and I might have a few more surprises too. Hey, thanks for riding the rails with me today. This is where I jump off. I'll see you next time. Blazor Trail!